We're so glad you're with us to stay curious. You're in the delivery room of America's Space Age with Gary Harris, a designer of spacesuits. Welcome, Gary. Glad to be here. Well, Gary, you live near here. You are a spacesuit expert. He works for De Leon Technologies, LLC, out of Cape Canaveral. We have got on our green screen here the Genesis sort of spacesuits from the early Mercury era to the modern times now. And we're going to talk with Gary about what's going on today, December 1st, with NASA's Artemis space uh, suit. Stay tuned for that because uh, maybe you're one of the companies that wants to build America's next Artemis space suit. Who do you think is going to do it? Yeah, I would be. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if some of the traditional companies don't get the contract. And we're going to talk about that in a few minutes here with Gary Harris, who has built the a spacesuit, Artemis uh, prototype sort of, that is in our Apollo gallery. There, we probably have had it in there for over a year, Gary. But we here always celebrate uh, space achievements here at the American Space Museum. You know that's why we're here. Mm -hmm. uh, and we want to celebrate before we get into Gary Harris, his life a little bit in these spacesuits. You're going to learn a lot about all the spacesuit technologies real quick. So sit back and relax. Uh, but first, we have got a birthday to talk about. And let's bring that up, Marty. And my first birthday today is, where is he? Looking for, there he is, uh, Terry Virts. Happy 54th birthday to Terry Virts, NASA astronaut, born December 1st, 1967 in Baltimore, Maryland. He considers Columbia, Maryland to be his hometown. An Air Force Colonel, Gary, Virts spent 213 days in space, three EVAs, okay. And we're going to talk about these extravehicular activities Uh uh, some in space history and some that are going to plan for the International Space Station this week. He was on STS-130, one of the last shuttle missions, and he was the expedition uh, commander of Expedition 43 on the space station. So a very experienced astronaut, Terry Virts, his birthday today. Uh, Gary, when uh, following the death of Star Trek actor Leonard, Leonard Nimoy, Virts, tweeted an image of his Vulcan salute that I can't do. Can you do that? I can't oh, yeah. do it. Oh, yeah. Okay. There you go. Gary's doing it. Sorry, I can't do that. I have to cut a tendon or something. Yeah. Marty can do it over there. Marty Winkle, our cameraman <laughs> and running the board today. Uh, and, of course, Marty's a veteran space uh, worker with the Gemini, I mean, the Grumman Lunar Module and the Launch Process Service working on the engines for the shuttle. So happy birthday, Terry Virts. And uh, next little item we've got to talk about, Gary, is on this date in history in 19, uh, in the year 2000, STS-97 was launched, and that's 21 years ago, and it put the first solar panels on the ISS, the big ones on the top up there. And this is a photograph in, in 2020 after the STS-90 mission, 97 mission, and uh, Joe Tanner and uh, Noriega were the spacewalkers. Three times they went on there. Here is the re release this week from uh, Thomas PK, ESA astronaut, European Space Agency astronaut. This is what the space station looks like tonight as it's flowing overhead, uh, continuously occupied for over 21 years. Oh, let me go back. There's, there's what it looked like 21 years ago, folks. And there's what it looks like now. And uh, Gary, let's see, I'm kind of looking for the cupola. Uh, I think that's down on the other end there. There's a Soyuz spacecraft. Just so intriguing what's going on. And they're going to do a spacewalk Thursday. This is Wednesday. It was, it was postponed because of the space debris from a Russian uh, detonation. They, they are not detonation, ASAT, target. ASAT yeah. test. ASAT test. Uh, 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 and... Uh, Bad situation there, but they're watching this space debris carefully. And Gary's going to show us some pictures of the latest Artemis suit in that meteoroid cover there in just a minute here. So let's see. I think that's all of our space history we wanted to roll through. We got Terry Virts there's birthday. And uh, what we want to talk about with Gary here, let me take that off a second there, Marty. Uh, uh, get that's us our fine. background there. 
and um, uh, Gary back on there. There we go. Gary, we did want to mention that uh, you have an extensive career uh, in uh, uh, aerospace technology. Uh, he is a uh, very involved with one of the unsung institutions of the space age, and that would be the University of North Dakota. Mm -hmm. uh, Odegaard, is that how you say that? Uh, University of North Dakota's Odegaard School of Aerospace Sciences. Uh, I worked 17 years with uh, Pablo de Leon up there. He's uh, He runs the laboratory, and uh, that's in the space studies department. Mm -hmm. But now, anything I say here is not sanctioned by the university. Okay. No, it's well, purely me, okay? Well, good. But I was a consultant primarily to the university. Well, I saw a big, thick book that you didn't have many of that you wrote uh, that you wrote about uh, that you wrote about uh, space suits. Uh, we've had Gary on one of our earlier Stay Curious programs about a year ago uh, when we were doing some old school, and we're going to do a little old school pictures here in just a minute. But uh, Gary, tell us where you grew up and and how how you got fascinated with doing this. I was uh, born in Mitchell, Indiana, oh. and uh, that's the home of Gus Grissom. It's they uh, when I was a kid, that was that during the early years of the space age. So that was all pretty fascinating. Right, you and I are the same yeah, age, I baby would, boomers. That had yeah, to be interesting, knowing yeah. that Gus was a Mercury astronaut going. Yeah, we were from then your I. Hometown. I, he'd be uh, ten, uh, he's about 10 or 12 years older than us, probably. Oh, quite a bit, yeah. Yeah, I, he'd have been 90-something. Uh, uh, if he was still alive right, today, yeah. yeah. He hadn't died in the 204 fire. But, uh, yeah, my dad went to school with uh, Gus Grissom, and, and uh, he was sort of the hometown hero. Oh, but absolutely. It wasn't just that. I mean, I, for example, I played hooky from school when they launched Al Shepard. Did you really? And, oh, yeah. I pretended to be sick to stay home from school to watch that. I also managed to dodge out when they made the last Mercury launch, too. So I I saw those. And then, of course, there was the Gemini program and the Apollo. So, yeah, I was a, I was a big space cadet when I was a kid. Sure. The Gemini but, program for us growing up, uh, Gary, was really something. In 1966 and 65, every other month was a two-man flight. Right, yeah. And you know what? The Russians didn't fly one, one flight. Uh, during that two years of our Gemini program, they went from Vostok three, or the uh, Vostok two, the spacewalk with Leonov, to the tragedy of, of Soyuz one in, in 1967. Yeah. So a little bit of space history there. We're talking with Gary Harris, principal designer of De Leon Technologies here. Gary worked at White Sands Missile Range in 1972, right out of a uh, 18, 19 years old, huh? Yeah, worked on the Nike Hercules. Uh, uh, the the Sprint Spartan and later the Patriot missile systems. Uh, he's also a professional diver for how many years? Oh, twenty between twenty and twenty five years. Commercial, I was a commercial diver, commercial hard hat huh? diver. Yeah. And is that where you got interested in spacesuits, or, it, or how'd that come of, about? It sort of is. I uh, uh, actually I'd had interest in spacesuit technology for that, but while I was a commercial diver uh, working in. Uh, uh, Houston, Texas, I uh, uh, got interested in life support systems because there's a lot of life support system work that goes into it. When people think of commercial diving, they think of scuba, but it's nothing like scuba. It's mm -hmm. uh, in the, especially in the offshore oil fields, that's which is where most commercial diving goes on. It can be, it's very deep work. So, so our stay curious listeners out there, they're scuba divers and go looking for coral and so forth like that it's, tell us in a nutshell what the difference is between well the professional commercial divers. divers are are gosh it's hard to reduce it down to nothing scuba divers are uh, essentially recreational divers and mm -hmm. professional divers you do it for a living right but it's you just don't use scuba you use modern commercial diving equipment and they do a lot of things like cleaning out uh, intakes mm, of that, systems yeah that's stuff done like that i've done some of that yeah i've, I've uh, worked on nuclear plants where they would take in water to cool the reactors. Mm -hmm. I've uh, uh, dove in some of the uh, the hot pools. I've dove uh, hot most, pool being a well, where they keep the uh, the rods that have oh my uh, gosh, the really? rods that have, what kind of special suit was that? Involved? Well, you have to be isolated from the water. Yeah, you wear a plastic suit that isolates everything but your face, and then you get inside a dry suit, which, uh -huh. and then, of course, you wear a helmet with it, to, to, and the helmet has double exhaust valves to stop any backflow of water. 
And if you get the water in there, then they have to scrub you down head to toe. Mm. So it's, it's, yeah, it takes a huge crew to do it. And you have to go through their training and meet their standards in each one of the nuclear reactor companies like KG&E or any of those. And they're all over the country. They, you dive all over the country to do that. But that, most of what, what I a, What did, unique uh, uh, professional uh, profession there is. It is there, unusual. There are only 5,000 professional divers in the whole world. That are in the whole world, 5,000. Yeah, very small oh. club. The vast majority actually work offshore in the oil fields. Uh, in, uh, they support uh, offshore oil drilling operations and pipe laying and, and a- anchoring systems, for example, for offshore rigs and and uh, it's mostly that that kind of work. So tell our stay curious watchers how this. Our stay curious watchers, by the way, are on YouTube, and on Twitch, which is a gaming platform, and of course Facebook. And we're very grateful for you all watching us. And tell your friends to like us, share us, subscribe to us, and follow us. And uh, this is the holiday season, by the way. So buy those gifts on Amazon with Amazon Smile as American Space Museum your favorite nonprofit. And uh, Gary's been involved with our nonprofit for several years and and has helped us out with a lot of different things. And uh, watch on Facebook or on YouTube over and over because we need to get those channel hours up there. So (laughs) there's a lot of good programs on there. We're pushing 400 episodes, uh, uh, Gary, and you were on a previous one before. We're doing a little different one here. We're going to show some uh, old school pictures here in a minute because we didn't have a chance to load them up, but we're going to take you through the evolution of spacesuits real quick, uh, and then we're going to talk about what's happening uh, today in in history today where NASA. Uh, uh, let, let's get to that uh, right now uh, as I go up to my uh, images there, Marty, and we'll have the two years ago. Two years ago in October. Uh, NASA, with Bridenstine as its administrator there, had this big unveiling of the new Artemis spacesuit here, all right, and uh, which is similar to what Gary's demonstrator is in our our uh, museum. And uh, I'm going to turn him loose about this. What has transpired in two years, and why is today, December 1st, the deadline for you to get your bid in for a Artemis space. Well, they've design. changed that to go into that. They've changed the originally. If you look on the picture that you provided there, you see the lady in the middle. That's that's Amy Ross. That's Jerry Ross's daughter. Okay, Jerry Ross. She's a Jerry Ross, seven time space walker. Mm-hmm. She was the uh, or seven uh, time, uh, astronaut uh, principal engineer on the development of this suit program. Okay, and uh, uh, She's a, she's a fine person, fine engineer. I've had the opportunity to to meet her at some of the environmental conferences, and uh, but they NASA made a decision. Apparently, it's Kathy L- Luters or Leaders, however you yeah, pronounce leaders, her name. Yeah, Leaders, I believe. Uh, I guess she's the head of the Artemis program, isn't yes, she? Yeah, uh, she. The man space. She crap. made a, the the decision that instead the of doing what they're originally going to do, which was to build two of these suits. And then they were going to use the early ones in 2023 on the International Space Station as a test. And this is, this is, uh, okay, you can well, let's see get that, that up uh, there. We got, we got, you uh, can see this show is, and tell this there, is Gary. Just something you can pull off of can, the, uh, off of the go. internet. The, um, thank you. Greg. We got Jessica in the house the, here. She's handling the camera work there. Gary brought a few little pictures here. We didn't get loaded up. You can up, see but it's right, important to our right here. Do you see this suit system? Yes. But if you look from here down, you'll see that's the shuttle EMU. Okay. And it's going to be mated, or originally it was going to be mated to this upper torso, which was the upper torso of the X EMU. So they took the pants of the current shuttle. Well, the and, lower and torso the lower assembly, torso yeah. Of and then you can see here, this is the early, one of the early experimental versions of the upper torso of the EMU. Mm-hmm. And that's was going to be. Now, I don't know if they're still going to do that. This program's a lot in flux right now. Does that save money? Well, it was going to be part of the of the uh, provenance. You know, you have to certify something. You have to certify anything you're going to do in space. And quite frankly, certifying with something with NASA just about takes an act of God. Anyway. <laughs> so they uh, this was going to be one of the certifications of the the suit system. Okay. All right. Then well, they were well, going to. Well, yeah. then the the problem is that they were going to build two suits. And and these suits were going to be used in the early Artemis lunar landings, and they were and NASA 
of course, it was going to contract out the the components. And uh, the problem was is that they were, uh, but NASA was going to be the integrator you see and the and the user of those of that suit systems. The uh, uh, that's all been changed. Okay. And what happened is that NASA made the decision that they were not going to to um, leave that there. You got a couple of pictures. Yeah, I'm gonna leave it right yeah. there. Good. Do you want to leave it up there? Because I got okay. You're yeah, talking. go ahead. They, yeah, the they've decision. made the, they've made the decision that what they're going to do is instead is um, um, uh, contract it out. But what they're going to do is rent the suits from the contractor. They're not going to own them like the NASA's done in the past. So now these are a one billion dollar suit. Well, or more by the time the program gets finished. We'll talk about why it's been so expensive to develop this system. But here's the, the most current iteration of the XEMU. Like this week's uh, pictures of it. Yeah, here. these are just out of just a short while back. You can see it rather the the micro, thermal micrometeoroid garment here looks a little bit ill fitting. That's because it's still early in the program. So there's a spacesuit underneath this, uh, like snowsuit, for better analogy. Well, this, you see this this uh, uh, thermal micrometeoroid garment here. Mm -hmm. This was when the NASA administrator, the new administrator, was visiting uh, NASA, and they were showing us. You can see, for example, Bill like Nelson. Right, Nelson was there. You can see where he's uh, rotating at the waist to show the waist joint that's in it, the, rot the waist bearing. Now, this is a covering over the suit that yeah. we saw previously on there. This will protect you from space debris hitting you. Micrometeoroids. Uh, micrometeoroids, debris, right. but it might not uh, uh, protect you from a bolt that is on that well, errant uh, spacecraft. Yeah. This will, exactly what, what the suit will look like in the end, we don't know yet. We just don't know because there's uh, also a great deal of interest in trying to figure out how to limit any any regolith or lunar dust right. that's going to be tracked back into the space vehicle itself. You remember during Apollo, yes. they were just, lunar dust was everywhere. It's if finer you, than talcum powder is going to get into well, everything. Well, it can get down and, as small and, as, and, as and, uh, five microns. That's tiny. And the 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 thing is, is that you can, if you look at the astronauts when they were inside the lunar module mm -hmm. in those days, you see every one of them had bloodshot eyes. Their eyes were red around them. Yeah. That's that lunar dust. Right. It's, it's in everything. It's in the sinuses. So, they're wanting to limit the lunar dust that's tracked in or that's brought into the to the lunar vehicle, the lander, uh, down to if I remember right, it's it's only like it's only a tiny percentage. I don't remember the number, but it was. But overall, the uh, of the 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 garment area, what the uh, they were wanting to get it down to like less than four percent. Some sort of repellent material now, on well, there. Or, uh... Well, we worked on that. The universities worked on that, and several other universities have worked on it programs. And of course, NASA's private contractors have also worked on it. So we don't know what the outside of the suit mm -hmm. is going to truly look like. Show us one of the new innovations of the helmets there. Well, this is uh, this is actually Collins Aerospace. This is this is their suit idea and you'll see it has a lot in common it's a rear entry closer suit you go in through a back hatch you're going like to see our demonstrator here in a minute you'll see here the uh the helmet this is uh this is an ovaloid helmet it's not it's not uh hemispherical ovaloid, it's ovaloid. Ooh, yeah that's it's, fun to say ovaloid i know that's quite a word <laughs> it's uh it's why it looks hemispherical from the side hemisphere being a half of a uh -huh. globe half a sphere it is in fact uh, an oval when you look at it from the front oh. it's narrower at the front than it is than longer this way but you see this one is actually a double bubble and that's kind of the thinking now it's this, uh, it has a bubble on the inside and then a and then another extra protection the that's course. right the, the of course this stuff is made of lexan and it will bend in about 50 millimeters under a blow so it's pretty tough but if you look back at the shuttle suit it only had a single pressure uh, limiting uh, mm -hmm. uh, bubble there. Interesting. This Never has thought two. about that innovation, Gary. The, well, the it, uh, mm -hmm. uh, interesting thing is about a double bubble is that, that uh, I suggested it to NASA at an environmental conference, and the guy just looked at me like I was crazy and walked off when really? we were having a discussion about it. And then, but it's interesting. It was actually it Joe Cosmo down at Crew Systems Division, who was uh, started with NASA back in 1961. He was the first one to actually uh, suggest a double bubble on an EVA hmm. suit. It wasn't me. I didn't invent the idea. I just pushed for it. And then I thought it was interesting that when they first, then they started coming up with the suit, and it turned out to have a double bubble. So I, 
you Double know, bubble. I guess I need to call it Bazooka Joe <laughs> for our, our, our gum there. Great uh, minds uh, think alike. Uh, I suppose. Do what you're doing there with uh, continue with. Well, what I was going to show some more there. about the suit. This yeah. is uh, is earlier. Once it's again, still... that 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 other covering you saw here, this covering that's the thermal is covering, micrometeoroid is covering this spacesuit here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you've got this over. Mm -hmm. This we want to emphasize. You'll see so here. Here's the, that here's is. where you see the ovaloid. See the ovalness of the helmet. Yeah. Now the okay. reason that is is because NASA is doing something that was really pretty smart this time. Back in the old days, they they had all men were uh, were the astronauts. They were all test pilots, and they were all within a, a a particular size of anthropometry. You know, the 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 all the remember all the Mercury astronauts anthropometry. Be, yeah, the sizing yeah, of humans. Right, yeah. they, they couldn't be any taller than five feet eleven. If uh -huh. you remember, and and then of course the shortest was was uh, Gus. Gus, and he was five six. You know. And, uh, you know, the old joke was that he was the only guy that could fit in the Gemini spacecraft and <laughs> yeah. get the door closed because they had to shove everybody else's head down. There. Right, right. But NASA started I'm off, the, that, the yeah. folks down at the spacesuit division there at Crew Systems, they started off with building these upper torsos really to fit women and work their way up from there. And that's why you have one of the reasons you have the ovaloid on here is because it allows you to take these bearings, these shoulder, the side bearings here in the shoulder, and bring them in much narrow where hmm. women need them. And it's the side bearings. That's we'll we'll do that a little yeah. bit later. These and the that's the advantage of having that narrow in the front. I now, see. plus on a lunar surface, you can take that helmet, and if it gets marred on one side, and you can turn it around and use the other side. Now that's not quite as good as a hemispherical helmet because right. if you if you mar the front on a hemispherical helmet, you can just move it a little bit. You see, gotcha. each time and keep rotating. This way, you can only move it twice, but it's better than than so just it's a complete globe. Uh, that's right. It's all one that, solid that, that piece. One solid piece. Yeah, you don't have. Uh, any... Jessica Meir was just uh, in the news talking about her spacewalk on the space station where she was swimming in her spacesuit. It was a medium, and she's very petite, and really had difficulty. Uh, uh well, and, and I know uh, one of the other lady astronauts, they, they didn't have her do a spacewalk because she was so couldn't small. fit them, yeah. Couldn't, couldn't yeah. Fit well, the, you uh, they actually have on the shuttle EMU, they actually have a kind of what they call the the the, the uh, mattress, uh -huh. and it's just like a big uh, a cushion that they shove in there with you, you oh, know, really? to help because you got to be packed in there pretty tight for two reasons. Number one, if you're floating around inside the suit, you're not going to be effective. You've got to get those bearings here and the joints here. They have to absolutely be in the exact same spot that you're flexing your arm. You okay. see? And, and if you're not in that area, then it's not going to work very well. So that the, the, but that also leads to one of the problems is that, that the, the shuttle EMU, because the, the room that's inside of it, you know, it, and they have to pack you in there with all these cushions. It's very mm -hmm. tough to, to don and doff. And mm -hmm. that's one of the reasons they're using the rear entry suits because they're mm -hmm. much, much easier to get into. Well, let's show a couple other things here. Uh, we'll go look at those other pictures and we'll talk about the suit technology in a minute. But, uh, uh, Gary, we're looking here at something that you gave the museum. And this is, tell us what we're looking at here. Well, that's Gary. a very early prototype built at the Human Spaceflight Laboratory using 3D technology. It's the first prototype that I'm yes. aware of that uh, that's everything, well, with the exception of the metallic parts, the angle parts you see. those The blue parts and the rings were the, the first 3D printed spacesuit elements. First 3D printed mm -hmm. spacesuit elements here at the American Space Museum, mm -hmm. one of our newer displays. Uh, you know, I cannot believe how 3D technology has just burst in you the know, last five years. It it's has really and it amazing. hasn't, but it's Pat really a big pardon. You got Pat. You got Pat. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, really Jessica's cool. showing that up there. Yeah. And and this here is another piece that's kind of priority because it's, it's got cloth in it. It's got if you show it real close, it's got some sort the of time of fabric embedded in it. This is what these this is these elements here. Uh huh. This is what you're right. seeing there's these elements. Yeah, the blue elements are red here uh, up there. Plastic. Uh, so this will hold pressure. It's, it's like and, a uh, yeah, it's uh, a composite. I I'm not at liberty to say how they right. how they made it. Like I said, it's kind of a prioritized. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Uh, yeah, this is the nice. latest thing Gary gave to us here uh, at the museum on loan. Uh, this is what he does: is 
is uh, built spacesuits. Let's look. Well, I at did. I didn't build these. I did the design work on. Okay. I built the hard elements for the for the lab, and then the the but the students up at the university are the ones that actually build okay. these parts, and they they're the ones that three D design them on computer. They're computer aided design, and then they have a, a three D printer up there. So it is. You can see that work. it can go from from uh, neutral. Yeah. And all the way to about 110 degrees, which is what you've got to get. That's wow. good. that's about everything your arm can do. Now, when you pressure it up, it's not quite that mobile. Right. Because you're going to have some of this material is going to be in the way, right? So it'll, but it'll still go about 110 if, if you push it. Now, this was the reason this looks so crude is because it was just the very first attempt. Yeah, first we're going to spend a lot of money. You got your, he's got his old snow, uh, snow glove from North Dakota on there. Yeah, but <laughs> you see, this is one of our, you, you do have a, uh, this is an actual pressure suit joint though, there. Is it? The, yeah. the brown. Okay. I built these. This is built out of a material called uh, uh, combat which is like some of the toughest material you can buy anymore. Well, this is what our nonprofit's about, is relics of the space age, from the birth of the space age, right here in the delivery room of America's space this, age. This suit here would be used uh, if they, you know, if they ever, if they eventually perfect this technique, because this is brand new. If they eventually perfect it, though, it would be used in much later stages on the lunar surface and on Mars. Interesting. Well, we're going to show a couple slides here. One is of... Uh, uh, one of your mentors, uh, if I get those up there, Marty, there, no, we'll go from there. There, we'll go to the next one. Uh, oh, there, yeah, there you are with, uh, our space suit here. It's the and, NDX2. Uh, make that bigger, Marty. There we go. I'm sorry, that's a HXS9, that's right. But, uh, see how familiar that looks, all right, and how cool that is, Gary. Uh, and now that's a with, hemispherical helmet on uh, there. Hemispherical mm -hmm. helmet on there. Uh, we're going to see a close-up. It's got the microphone embedded in it and earphones so they don't have to wear the Snoopy suit, which uh, sometimes is not well, so Well, that's on right? the new XEMU. That's what they're doing away from is the Snoopy cap. They It has integrated speakers in the helmet itself. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, with modern noise cancellation microphones, right. you don't really need that speaker like, you, you know, the... The Snoopy cap okay, like they used gotcha. during Apollo. They still might use something to keep the hair out of your eyes, you know, or something of that nature. This but. display we have here. He's opening up the back of it there where you get and walk into the back of this thing like the Russian Orlon suits that they've mm -hmm. had for years. Uh, and we're, we're going to talk about this gentleman briefly, your mentor, Bill Elkin. We mm -hmm. don't. We hope Bill is, is still around. He visited He's 90 our museum. years old or 91 Over 90. Now. Yeah. Uh, and uh, tell us about Bill Elkin and, and your career. Well, if you look on there, Bill was, uh, I actually started in, in working with Weaver Aerospace in space suit and pressure suit technology back in 95. And I really needed to find somebody that could educate me about it. And because I was like most people, I didn't realize how complicated just the pressure structure is, let alone the life support system. Hmm. And I was fortunate in that Vic Vickacall out at Ames Research Center, who was a spacesuit designer himself, uh, he built the early uh, AX series of hard suits that were all hard. That was Vic. And, and Vic pointed me, he said, you need to talk to Bill Elkins. And Bill lives right down the road, and I've worked with him for decades. And Bill was, uh, he was, if you look at the, well, go back a minute there. Yeah. If there you look you at to the right, well, both of those suits, Bill was the pioneer that built both those suits. Now, the one, the shiny one you see on there, that was built at Litton Industries. And uh, that is a heck of a suit. It's like a, a, a Buck Rogers suit. And there's a crank right where the belly button mm -hmm. is that you're sitting on a seat. A bicycle seat. And it raises and lowers you a, a bicycle seat. Well, you have seat, to understand right? something. If you look at the suit to the, to the right there, uh -huh. it has a waist joint in it. Right. And if you look at suit to the left, no, it has no, no waist, waist joint. Yes, when you sir, don't you have a waist over. joint and you and you try to bend, what happens is that you sink down in the suit. Here's the oh. base piece. So because it didn't have a waist joint, well, then they rigged it with a bicycle seat and that crank that would crank you huh. back up into the helmet. Now, when I first saw that, I thought it had something to do with a urine dump or something. <laughs> oh, right. I didn't realize, but uh, yeah, we had a good laugh. But, it, you know, something that's interesting is if you look on the suit there, uh -huh. you see it has a bandolier fashion closure. Yes, across opening. the chest yeah. there. That was designed by G. Fonda Bernardi. He was an Italian that came to the United States and worked for Lytton after World War II, and he, yeah. was, he was a submarine officer. That's a torpedo tube. 
that's how they would close a torpedo tube on a submarine. That's is, how, and he used the same type of is closure. Is that right? Wow. Yeah. What great history here with Gary Harris. You also look on their way to say, before yeah, that, you, move, right you see the shoulders and the leg joints and all yeah. that? That's rolling convolute. That's where the rolling convolute joint started. And if you look right here, remember right. this picture you saw right we there saw on the arm? And plus the, here, right here. Plus in this. Well, no, not that. Oh, right not here. That. Look okay. at, right. If you look at right here, yeah. that's a rolling convolute on the newest suit. Oh. That goes all the way back into the late 50s. Wow. So that's why I said there's a lot of technology going into the XEMU. A new technology but it's, but it's not necessarily new technology it's it's mature technology that's been around for literally decades but it never got applied to an eva suit before the well there's yeah there's well, on top, Bill, uh, well there's another reason too the xemu is going to be used at pressures between 4.3 and about 8.2 uh -huh. to 8.3 psi they're not certainly how they want to pin that down but the rolling convolute is just about the only shoulder type joint that you can use that will stand up under those pressures wow that's a lot of pressure and so it's, it's still 60 year old technology yeah there's you and bill when he visited with his son we we're gonna we'll probably contact his son and say we talked about his dad mm -hmm. hope he's still with us but uh, uh uh really a good guy to talk about spacesuits there and in fact, well, they become members of our. They live in California. Yeah, that, Bill right? lives up by San Jose still. Yet he, uh, a lot of the technology that's in modern EVA suits, he was the father of. The bearing systems that's in the the shuttle EMU uh -huh. was uh, was originally his his uh, design, and then it sort of changed. Uh, but it was originally his design. A lot of the technology in the EMU. No came tribute from him. to Bill Elkins there, one of the a lot one of, of the fathers of the spacesuit there with Gary Harris. Add that a lot of the technology that was uh, that was in the that Litton suit, that, that shiny one that you saw back mm -hmm. there. A lot of the folks that worked on that suit system, like like uh, uh, Buck Scott and a few others. Uh, uh, they were the ones that developed the flat pattern joint that's used in the shuttle EMU as well. So yeah. a lot of that technology all came out of Litton Industries more than it did any company today. Interesting. There's yeah. a classic photo I had to show in. Is we're going to take you quickly through the evolution of the American spacesuits. This is the first. Well, tell us what we're looking at. Well, it's a high-altitude pressure suit. It was built by B.F. Goodrich and uh, Russ Coley down at the bf goodrich company this is a third version they built two before this one of them they the first one exploded and the second one when they pressured it up it was a warm day in july and in uh, back in those days they didn't have air conditioning at the bf goodrich plant so wiley post who was the pilot that was financing this got stuck inside of it they had to use scissors and cut him out of it oh my god and then this one was built and if you look on it you'll look on the face piece you'll see that the face piece is shifted slightly to one side because wiley only had one eye oh. he was an oil field hand in oklahoma and he was using a five pound maul sledge and chip of metal came off and put his eye out but Wiley had quite a, a, a interesting history. He'd been a robber. He he was a, a holdup man. That um, yeah, a lot of people don't I know, know that. that Wiley Post, a real legend yeah. of, of Americana in the 1940s. And, and if 30s, you look at that, that suit uh, died system. in a plane crash with. Uh, uh, who did he die with in a plane crash? He was a a, 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 a columnist or an American mm -hmm. uh, yeah, American uh, uh, oh, comedian and yeah. And, who are we uh, thinking of Marty? Well, any other time it would have jumped uh, out at me. Yeah, well, someone will tell us. Wiley Post died with uh, uh, not Buck Rogers, but no. it's a, it's a name like that. Uh, uh, not Google not Roy Rogers. His last name was uh, Wiley Post. And anyway, yeah. Well, we're, we're gonna look. We're gonna go through okay, here. Okay, there's the, the the Mercury pressure suits. They the were also pressures. designed by Russ Colley. Okay. And I, I once asked uh, uh, one of the guys. Will Rogers. Will yeah. Rogers, thank you. The tricky uh, techie. Will I was, Rogers. I once asked one of the guys that, that helped work on that program there why the suits were silver. And he said there wasn't any real good reason other than they just didn't want them to look like the, the US Navy Mark IV suits. Oh, is that they right? Were, yeah, they, they were they were aluminum aluminate coated on what the I outside. like, Gary, is for this famous photo, uh, one of the most famous photos of space uh, man space history, the boots, some of them they spray painted. Mm -hmm. it jump was an, boots and aluminum paint. Yeah, they were jump boot, parachute jump boots. Yeah, and the like, boot. You know, I always wonder about the feet. The feet get the least attention. It seems like on a space suit. I don't. It, well, there's a bladder goes down inside the boot. Uh -huh. like, that's that's interesting. You'd say that because there's been recently, I've I've uh, 
uh, one of the papers that was published at the last environmental conference. I say environmental conference, but that was actually when, when it's environmental as of space environmental. It was a paper that was about boots, what kind of boots would need mm -hmm. to be used on the moon in the future. And it was like they didn't seem to understand that the the boot won't flex very well because the boot's pressurized. Right. So, you know, they were talking all about the flexing, but they seem to keep forgetting that it's a pressurized structure, you know. If you look back at the old uh, Apollo uh, crews on the moon, mm -hmm. you'll see their boots would hardly bend at all. Right. And in you fact, our, our demonstrator here has what kind of boot on it that they'll take back? It has a solid boot. Well, it's a Dutch shoe type of oh, boot. Oh, well, yeah, yeah the, well, the, no, the, the the, that was on the Litton one yeah. that you're talking about. That was a Sabo. That's called a Sabo. But they'll have a contour like that because they're leaning forward. Yeah, so you would much, actually. Right? That's what they did with the, the balls of their suits. feet. And toes killed them. Mm -hmm. Some of them said that they uh, because the 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 boot won't flex. Yeah, if you're watching the boot won't flex because yeah. it's pressure. It's got a bladder just, inside of it. It's a flat little. So and and they tried to build a, a, a Bill Elkins. I remember tried to build a, a suit that had a a mobility joint mm -hmm. where it would flex with the. And finally, they had to they had to call the contractor NASA and say, look, we just can't do it. We don't know how to build a flexible a boot with a joint in it. God, the technology, and now today, you know, we're going back. But we to still the don't know how to build still a boot that would flex. Yeah. Uh, uh, all right, we're going to go through here. You can make these uh, big, Marty. Yeah, because, you're, uh, you were talking about the the. the uh, we're going to go through a, the era here, just yeah. sort of a fun thing. Gemini. This is the representation of the Gemini suits, which were really just an Air Force high altitude pressure suit. Okay. And then the Apollo moonwalking yeah. suit here. It was the very first suit that we built. It was a true EVA suit or a true space suit. You might use that word. And who built these suits? Let's the ILC Dover built the, the International Latex, Latex Corporation, Corporation yeah. of they, Dover. Uh, they built the ones that were used on the on the moon. And, and then, Jessica, you know them as Playtex. International well, Latex <laughs> Corporation. <laughs> well, I don't wear Playtex. Marty, do you wear Playtex? Yeah. Yeah, no. I guess it is a, okay. A so, brand yeah, I, we know you can wear Under Armour and stuff like that, but, but yeah, uh, yeah they were uh, ILC. Uh, they, uh, we talked with. They Nicole's make a lot of product. They make a lot of pro. They make a lot of products. For There's example, a pumpkin that, suit of the mm, shuttle era. That's also that's built by Dave Clark Corporation up at Worcester, Massachusetts. Dave Clark was another big one mm -hmm. in, in there. Uh, uh, in there. Uh, here's three different suits. Okay, kind that's of the Apollo there. suit. That's Bill Airy there on the left. He's with. He's uh, one of the senior folks that's with ILC. I think Bill may be retired now. Okay. The two other fellas, I don't know, but the one in the middle is. He the, knows the people that are the models of the spacesuits, folks. Yeah, the, the one we in the middle. We have expert Gary Harris here with us. You better believe it. Well, I'm not. A, I'm not an expert, but I am a specialist in well, that area. But anyway, the good enough for stay uh, curious. The Gary. the uh, <laughs> uh, the guy in the middle. That's of course. Uh, that's the that's the shuttle EMU. Yeah, there. shuttle which are yeah. using it just tomorrow to do an EVA. Yeah, it just doesn't have there. the seat. And it joins at the waist and. It once again, this is mm -hmm, the, the, mm -hmm. the micrometeoroid suit over. And then on the far left is one of the very right. early suits that ILC built. That was, uh, the, I think that's the the eye suit, and they uh, that was when they were just beginning uh, uh, way back there during the Constellation program. Okay. For an advanced suit. Well, this that's, is what we're talking about. The one of the generations in the art world of the the Artemis suit. Yeah, I don't. I don't. This is supposedly a. A picture or a artwork piece of the XEMU. I don't know. And how about those suits? Well, they're just movie. Uh, they are from two thousand one. The moon look, suits. If when you look at the, at the if you look at the helmet, it's kind of a a bad design because uh, you think about it when you're when you're walking on a uh, on a surface that's called locomotion or locomoting. Uh -huh. And but when you're moving along a spacecraft hull, that's translation. Now, how do you look out the top of the helmet if you don't have a visor up there? Right. So you look at that. That's just they didn't think that through. You know when they design, when they come up with that. That's the the of course the the Boeing the Boeing Starliner suit, yeah. suits there. They, well, some of our blue. some of our ex students up at the university worked on that program. Did they? Yeah. And uh, of course the now famous SpaceX suit. Yeah, but that's that's you know that that's something you have to kind of clarify. Uh, we use the word spacesuit just to cover everything. Okay. I mean, like the Clarified. Mercury suit's a spacesuit, but they're really not spacesuits. A, a spacesuit is something that is like an EVA suit because it becomes your primary source of protection right. against yeah. against the. Did I? This use would acronym? not protect you outside the space. It would not. Uh, it's yeah. extra, extra vehicle, vehicle activity. activity. Okay. Always clarify the uh, <laughs> the uh, uh, 
this the suit like the mercury suit or the gemini suit is a backup to the spacecraft cabin so it's really what's referred to or has been for decades as a launch entry suit launch it's entry. a launch entry suit okay. now it's kind of interesting when you say the word spacesuit because the russians kind of make that same that same uh, uh what's the word I'm, I'm looking for that that same overall idea and that, that what they call a space suit is is a scaphander which that ought to sound familiar to most people. Scaphander. The, the word skiff is what? A little boat. A little boat. Yeah. Ander is like android. That means a man. Okay. So it means man in a little boat. Oh, okay. It's scaphander. Really? That but makes they, sense. But they do alienate, the, they do uh, uh, break apart, if you will, the, 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 in that they call the Sokol a, a, a uh, uh, an emergency suit, mm -hmm. whereas the Orlon is an extra vehicular suit. Extra suit. You see? Yeah, good distinction there. You could not survive in the Boeing suit here. Uh, they're surviving on the moon and uh, fifty some years ago on the moon there. Uh, uh, these now these are designed for outside they're extra of the spacecraft. Space okay. suits, yes, which extra, is mostly uh, what we're talking about. But not the the pumpkin suits of well the, the early ones uh, that were shuttle were just cabin pressure uh, to they, keep you well, alive. Well, they would they would w work at a few pounds pressure. Yeah, they the early ones weren't made to work higher than fifty thousand feet. Okay. In other words, you got above fifty thousand feet and lost the entire cabin pressure. They they couldn't hold the pressure, but but because of the the helmet design. But yeah, you, you have to understand that with the shuttle, you could get uh, you could get a, a half inch hole in the shuttle. And it would take it many hours to decompress. Oh, really? To decompress. There's a lot of yeah. There's a lot of airspace inside there. Okay. So a half they, inch hole would still take. Yeah, a and time. it would still take. And of course, by that time, you'd probably be able to find Finds. it and somebody stick their finger in right. it. Right. <laughs> in the dike. You'd end up with the world's worst blood blister on your finger right but yeah Stuck you know. it right out but the, 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 the thing of it is space. though is that uh, that's one of the reasons why the shuttle early in the program never used uh, launch entry suits they designed a bunch of launch entry suits for it but never adopted any of them hmm. because they just thought well it you know you can make a within uh, you can be back on the ground in two hours if you absolutely have to you know with uh, any spacecraft that's of course the shuttle has to go find a runway so it's going to take it longer here's the uh Virgin Galactic outfit that you get. I guess it's not really a spacesuit. It's sort a of an coverall, to wear. yeah. Cover all. Instead of coverall. Uh, and we have coming uh, uh, soon a wonderful interview with a gentleman who's got the ticket number 234, <laughs> Eves Plendo. Yeah. And uh, we can't wait for to tell you when we're going to air Eve Plendo. You're going to learn so much about SpaceX. He's actually paid for his ticket 10 years ago, waiting in line. And it's a great little story there. And, of course, on the back of the spine there is the evolution, which is of, of flight, which is their uh, mm -hmm. blue or uh, uh, Virgin Galactic uh, Sir Richard Branson's outfit. And then Jeff Bezos says, well, everybody likes blue. Why does everybody like blue? How about mm -hmm. red? Throw a little orange in there. I mean, yellow or something. Uh, and uh, so uh, this is what you look when you're going suborbital. Uh, with Blue Origin in Texas, which uh, Michael Strahan, the Hall of Fame football player and, and TV personality, is going to go up with uh, Alan Shepard's daughter uh, That's what next I week. Uh, I think it's next week. So uh, uh, you won't be able to, to uh, get away from that with uh, uh, Strahan going up on that. And there again is that uh, look of there. Uh, there is a our, our Artemis suit here in our museum showing what's we're showing there, uh, Gary. Oh, I, that's the uh, neck aperture where the helmet attachment mm -hmm. just goes on. And you got the, the microphone, microphones that are wired into the show ears. the arrow there. The microphone's the black it, yeah, fixture right there, in front of uh, you and into at, the at side the of the, the ear speakers. Yeah. And then ear speakers are so you use the noise cancellation system inside the the uh, helmet yeah, mechanism. Yeah, great. Yeah. Right, yeah, right down there's the there's the ear. Speaker noise cancellation. Kind of an interesting story about the noise cancellation systems. And uh, the microphones at the bottom. Mark. For years, NASA didn't use a noise cancellation system in the in the uh, EMU. I'm not so certain they still have a noise cancellation microphone. I was talking to uh, uh, Jeff Fascia years ago. He was with that program, and he, uh, I remember he told me how it, it, that they were trying to get the EMU to to let NASA put the noise cancellation microphones inside the EMU and. Hmm. It, Trying to get him certified, you know, is, is that's why I said it sometimes takes an act of God to interesting really hearing. Something. You know, I've always thought they should have put uh hearing uh, uh microphones on all the landers on Mars, 
you know. They did. Uh, they finally did. did they finally on did on, on, on uh, Perseverance and Curiosity. Yeah. Uh, I don't think Curiosity has it. I, I don't think Perseverance know. I, does, but I remember maybe when it's they more first... complicated than you think uh, and, and uh, they loaded up in there. Here we've got another picture of Gary. Uh, we took a while back with uh, some of the dolls that you made there. Oh, yeah. Tell us a little bit about how you love cobbling these things together. Well, I, think... I, I, I do build those and sell them. I'm, re I'm semi-retired now. I still... Mm -hmm. I You'll still, never retire. You're, you're yeah, like, well, all of us. They still pay the, me a, a, a retainer fee so they can pick my brain. But I'm, I'm uh, good. I'm mostly retired. But anyway, I build these things. It's a, that and a lot of other things that I still have a small company that I run. We. Build and you want to get a hold of us? Uh, get a hold of us at Info at American Space Museum. We'll put you in touch with Gary. Well, I only build them on uh, demand. Somebody has to ask me to build one. I just don't produce many of them. I beg your pardon. Marty says he'll take an Apollo one there. <laughs> yeah. The and, trouble uh, it is is getting the Apollo ones is that I can't get that egg shaped helmet anywhere. I can get the hemispherical helmets and I can make the the ovaloid helmet, but I can't get that. You know the the Apollo helmet was a three D printer somewhere will make uh, it. I'm sure. Well, the problem of it is it won't it, it won't have much clarity to it that I'm aware of. So, yeah. There we got that. That's uh, uh, Chris Ferguson there, uh, who uh, was going to do the first flight and and uh, bowed out on Boeing, but he was the last commander of our shuttle. And there's Dave. You know, it's interesting about the Boeing suit there is if you look down at the waist, you'll see that there's a zipper. There are two separate zipper runs right there. What those are for is when you you can unzip that when you stand up. You see, it allows you to stand up straight. But when you sit down, you have to zip it in order to, that it'll hold oh. you into a sitting position. Interesting. As I say, there's a lot more technology just in the, just in the suit. Well, we've got a question so, from our Stay Curious uh, uh Brethren out there. Shoot. Leonard Tuscar wants to know, can you try it on when you visit the museum? No. <laughs> the problem of it is, is it... That was from Tuscar in Michigan up there. <laughs> They're still hung over from the Ohio State victory. No, they... Uh, him and Dave staying up there. The uh, problem Larry Tuscar, thank you for the question. We're so appreciative of everybody out there. Uh, Ophelia's in Paris. We've got... Uh, Robert Law is in uh, Dundee, Scotland. Uh, we've got uh, uh, had a, had a gentleman from uh, Italy the other day, and across the, across America, all kinds of people watch our program here. China, yeah. China, again, in Italy, and so uh, Ophelia in France, uh, and we're with uh, Gary Harris, who's who's given us his knowledge of spacesuits. Learned so much today in there. Uh, don't know if you wanted to go into your. Well, I was going to explain some of why the XEMU. There's been a lot of criticism of it since the, uh, the sure. Inspector General Go ahead. report. Yeah, there they. Uh, you got your little. Uh, the the trouble with the, the Inspector General report. The Inspector said that it's. Uh, tell us what that what they said and. Uh, well, they essentially said that the that the uh, the XEMU was the pacing item for the Artemis program and that it was the, the XMEU is, it was being blamed for holding up the program because they said it wouldn't be ready by 2024. And, uh, I, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with it at all. I think the, the, uh, the, the, you have to understand this about the XMU. One of the reasons that it's been so expensive and one of the reasons that it's, that, that, that they felt like it fell behind is that NASA has always, frankly, the, the folks up in Washington of NASA has always kind of looked on EVA technologies as sort of the redheaded stepchild. Hmm. And they've always looked on as this kind of ancillary uh, technology. Even uh, w during the shuttle program, if you remember, when the shuttle was first designed, they didn't want it to have EVA capability. They even designed the shuttle initially where if you had on EVA suit, if you, in other words, if you had in an emergency, if you had to get down the lower decks, get into the airlock, get an EVA suit on, you wouldn't be able to get up through to the command deck. The hatch was too small oh. between the two decks. They just hadn't thought it. They, right. You know, they just, that's, they, they were always putting EVA aside as if somehow it didn't have the importance. But, and that's interesting because if you think about the last years of the shuttle, the mm -hmm. last years of the shuttle, um, it, it was really acted as an EVA platform, didn't it? Oh, the, absolutely. The, the training, and, and we're talking about the space station, uh, 21 years occupied, over 250 EVAs, and that is two people they count as one EVA. So you take whatever EVAs they say on the space uh, station and, and times two people doing that. A comment from our Stay Curious watchers. A donation of stars. 
830 stars donated by Keith Soul. Keith Soul. Thank you, Keith. Keith is a former. Thank you very much. Met Keith the other day. Keith Sewell uh, uh, did some of our astronomy programs here mm -hmm. years ago uh, at the American Space Museum. And hope you get active with us, Keith. Thank you for coming in here. He's uh, part of the Brevard Astronomical Society. Uh, so uh, well, let me explain the rest of this. Question. All right. So Gary's going to give you some high that, science. Of the, 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 the XEMU is there's a lot of new technology yeah. in it. Mm -hmm. Is one of the reasons why. Well, okay. uh, uh, one of the reasons that it's that it's so expensive. Uh, so expensive. For example, but that it, new technology makes it safer and simpler. Well, it makes it where it's going to be able to work long term on the moon. That's the whole point. In the past, for example, if you wanted to, uh, uh, you had to absorb the CO two out of the breathing circuit. Uh -huh. When you breathe out, of course, the exhaled air, you can't rebreathe it. You've got to uh, remove the CO two from it. So one of the the new experimental are, are actually it's it's almost at flight sure. hardware well it, it's almost at flight hardware is a rapid amine cycle bed that's used to remove co2 in the past okay. they would zoom use in a, there please they All right. would use a uh, lithium hydroxide canister and the lithium hydroxide would get absor would absorb the co2 and then they could they could uh, change out the canister well you can't have a whole bring along a a whole box full of canisters. You'd be to towing it in a wagon behind right. you there. So <laughs> what they come up with was this system, which is a uh, swing check vacuum regenerative CO2 system. If you look on here, what it does is it it takes in your your uh, uh, the breathing circuit, your exhaled air, uh -huh. passes it through this amine bed, and that absorbs it. And then when it gets full, what it will do is it will expose that to the vacuum of space and then swing over it and open up this this bed, this amine bed, mm -hmm. and then that will complete the circuit, you see. So while this this material is exposed to the vacuum space, space absorbs the CO2. Interesting. So then when that component it gets filled up it swings back the other way and uses the original aiming bed you see it can swing back and forth as they get filled up with co2 okay. that's never been built into a eva system before that's what and that's that's new technology that's that's never been used there's other and it doesn't uh, have to be very big well no it's quite small i you, this is not a very good picture of it i had one in the earlier one that they weren't that they didn't get loaded but there's uh, uh, also for this the coolant system it doesn't show it on here but if you you can see this on the computer if you look it up on the internet you can you can see this picture and it tells you about the about the uh, right here membrane evaporation cooling and what that is is in the past they used a sublimator in the EVA in the uh, the backpack system now what a sublimator is it goes from a solid directly to a gas right sublimation is bypassing the liquid uh, state Car but, carbon dioxide, frozen CO2 does that. We use it all the time to make it goes from gas to, it goes that's from right. a solid to a gas. Yeah. That's called sublimation. So well, that's part of. But the there's other EVA ways system. to there's other ways to cool the astronaut in the you know for the metabolic cooling. Mm -hmm. But in the, in the EMU, for example, right now it uses a sublimator, and what that is is it has a feed water that that in a feed water tank that goes into a sublimator plate and the plate has little microscopic holes in it and it freezes on that plate okay and then here's the plate and it freezes on this side of the plate then here's another plate with microscopic holes and they pass the water through there okay that's the water that circulates around the astronaut mm -hmm. not the feed water and what that does is that cools that water as it comes back into him and and as that as that ice melts to gas or it doesn't melt mm. actually as it, as it sublimates into gas it takes the heat away from the astronaut but this is something altogether different this is another reason that it's quite expensive this this membrane evaporation evaporation cooling system actually uh uses the water that circulates around the the astronaut and it passes it into a, a um, an evaporator and what it does is that instead of going from a solid to a gas it goes from a liquid to a gas you see hmm. it evaporates it flash evaporates mm -hmm. off off this off this evaporation system and what that does is that you no longer have that heavy feed water mm -hmm. a whole another tank with a bladder and all that complexity okay. plus this system can actually cool just as well as a sublimation system and you don't it uh, um it's the interesting part of it to me is it's not really a new technology 
but it's been perfected by a lot of the folks down at uh, down to spacesuit branch down at uh, uh, crew systems division down at Johnson. But the interesting thing to me about this is this system of cooling an astronaut was first proposed by a, a, a guy named Ross at uh, the British Interplanetary Society back in uh, the 1950s. Is that right? If you right? look at the original suit, what they wanted to use was uh, an, ev an evaporator cooler that uses ammonia. But and I know huh. how good an idea it'd be to have a big tank of ammonia inside a spacecraft, but uh, they wanted to use ammonia because it will evaporate readily. Well, they use ammonia as a coolant on the space station. Well, they used to use ammonia, if you remember, in the ice plants when we were kids. Uh -huh. All those big ice plants, they all used ammonia, uh -huh. and they circulate. Fascinating they stuff. Uh, keep in mind as we pan out there and talking to Gary Harris and a wonderful program that you want to tell your friends to watch or rewatch on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitch. Um, when you're on the moon... Or in space is it's two hundred and fifty degrees in the sunlight and two hundred below zero. About two forty uh, yeah, on, uh, on on the shade there. So that's why he's talking about the cooling systems. You are in your own environment. You've taken your own uh, atmosphere with you, and and uh, you would die if you can't expel that carbon dioxide, uh, as we all know. And uh, fascinating new technology. What's old is new. And we've got another comment. Thank you, folks. Shout out to some new lights. Uh, Axel Diaz. Axel Diaz. Jim Moore. Jim Moore. Yeah, and yesterday was a uh, Brian Glode. Brian Glode. Are they watching us on which platform? Uh, all on Facebook. All on Facebook. Thank you, folks. Well, we hope you've enjoyed this conversation with Gary Harris. He's a he's a wonderful uh, friend of our museum. Uh, we look for more things to for, from him to come. He certainly might be on one of our celebration series panel someday as we bring back our monthly third Saturday of the week celebrations uh, of a certain space aspect. January is going to be animals in space and February is going to be diversity and I'm lining up people for that. Animals in space because ham was launched in January uh, 1961, January 31st I believe. So uh, Holloman Aerospace. And that's a whole, yeah, that's Holloman Aerospace. Space. Yeah, yeah, medical. The medical. Aerospace medical. Yep. There's debate whether that's what it was. It's also the initials of the general who was in charge of that program. Uh, right, yeah, yeah, ham. Some yeah. people say that it was his initials, yeah. but who knows. And uh, uh, some animals had their own spacesuits. Uh, in Russia, the dogs, they tried to do something with yeah, them. Yeah, they but... had a mechanical counterpressure suit. Yeah, some of them did, there, yeah. So. Well, if, if, if uh, uh, you want to know more about this, contact us. Gary is, is a wonderful guy. He'd love to make a spacesuit for you now. Marty's <laughs> going to be talking to him after the show, okay, uh, uh, about building you one. But uh, we've really enjoyed this, Gary. Thank you for all you do for our museum. Uh, uh, we've got on extended loan uh, that, that Artemis demonstrator suit out there that's a big hit in our museum. Quite an eye, uh, quite a selfie place too where people take pictures of course so anything you'd like to share with our stay curious people i didn't ask you about or no well, they just they, you know in exp just was trying to explain why the xcmu is has really been so expensive is because so it's much, worth it so it's much to, of the new technology is, is going into it and it's, it's to it's keep uh, and, and then it'll keep a woman and a man alive on the surface of the moon hopefully around 2024 2025 I, you know i i that uh, Honestly, I'd be surprised to see it before 2028. Honestly, 2028. Yeah. And it's not going to be because of the suit, though. No, it's the suit's not the pacing item. I, I don't believe the suit was a pacing item to begin with. I Was the suit behind? Yeah, if, because there's been years of underfinancing that technology. Mm -hmm. So you just don't. Like Tell Gary me. said, they're the redheaded stepchild of, yeah, of the space if, if industry. You, if you, uh, uh, you, you know, you don't underfinance a pro something for decades and then suddenly say, okay, now we need it tomorrow. There you go. So you go. yeah, so there, there's a, uh, but yeah, I think we're going to go back to the moon. I think it's, I think it's, uh, I don't use the word exciting. I wasn't in an occupation that you get excited for too many, for too many times if you want to stay alive. But the other side of that is, is it the. Uh, uh, I, it's it's interesting. I hope I'm 68 years old. I hope I'm around to see it. I, I can't think of anything I'd want to see more than to well, see an, an American back on the moon. We're the same baby boomers, and we thought by by this time in history there'd be uh, 30 there'd be, or 40 people on the moon like Antarctica. Well, I thought there'd be uh, at least a, a, a lunar science stations by and, now. Uh, you know, right? And 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 we need the science for the science plus 
everything is on the moon that's sustainable. There's a magic isotope called oxygen three that Harrison Schmidt, the 12th man on the moon, not the last, uh, Gene Cernan's toes were the last ones on the moon, uh, but Harrison Schmidt wrote a whole book about O3 and, and how uh, everything's there for us on the moon. Plus water is buried beneath craters at the South Pole. That's where we're going to land. And we got this gigantic uh, uh, starship uh, that's going to take us there, apparently, by SpaceX. And yeah. You and I know it looks awful lot those Buck Rogers movies. Does, yeah, it? It's, it looks a little bit. I worry about it. I, I Well, I don't worry. That wouldn't be the word I'd use. But. I'm concerned over it. Concerned. I, I, I trying to, it's a little bit looks like trying to back a Saturn rocket back down on the yeah, pad. You exactly. Know? When you get some, and remember during what was it, a, what, Apollo 15 or 16, with Dave Scott and the vehicle was was it could only lean over 20 degrees. Yes. When yeah. It landed. Yeah. So, lunar module so, uh, was, was very places. tilted over there. There fact, aren't many flat places on the south pole of the moon. So uh, landing, Marty's lunar module was tilted. It gave some concern of getting the rover out. Because it was tilted up, I think, to where the, well, the quad I, where the rover was. Marty could probably elevated. tell you better than me, but they also uh, the the guillotines and the other mechanisms for separating the he, descent he, vehicle from the landing vehicle, the landing part. Yeah, he worked on that. Wouldn't separate properly if you got past twenty degrees. So now they're going to land. This, Is that right, Marty? Yeah. Now they're going to land this. How many story? Yeah. vehicle on the moon, and it's going to have to be perfectly flat. Right. I, that's a little unsettling. Never you know? thought of it that way. Well, had a great time, buddy. Thank you for all you do for our museum and your expertise. He really knows his stuff, and this is a program you might want to replay some of it. wasn't too technical, but you're going to learn a lot about the why the new Artemis spacesuit is worth the money, a lot of new technology on it, and that's why you watch Stay Curious to learn new things. Gary, we appreciate all you do. Thank you, Marty, for running the board, Jessica, for being here and, and helping us uh, tweak it up there. And tomorrow, we've got a wonderful program about four shuttle missions launched on the same day. Uh, we're going to do a mashup of that on December 2nd. And, of course, Friday is Tales from the White Room with the one and only Triple T, Travis Thompson, who put the astronauts in their seats for over 20 years. So until then, I'm Mark Marquette. Come see our museum and bridge the space between us.